I mean, he had the power in his speeches to move the masses. As he listens to BBC, he is immediately convinced that they are telling the truth. My friend Helmut thought that was his Christian obligation to warn the people. And then he opened the door and there comes my friend Rudy. And I said, Rudy, what are you doing here? He is the third in our group. I said, what do you mean the third? Who is the second? And Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. The first thing we see is that he's emerged from some kind of a process as a full-blown anti-Nazi. He puts the prefix V-E-R on the front of the word Führer, which means that Hitler is now the seducer of the people. I opened the door and there's the two guys with that long dark leather coat and he lifted up his lapel from the coat and there was the badge, Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth. The truth was deadly. Hey everyone, welcome to the Truth and Conviction live stream. Um, I'm Matt Whitaker, creator and director of the Truth and Conviction series, and happy to be here. I'm, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I want to uh, give a special shout out to all of our Angel Studios fans. We're really grateful to have you here tonight. And uh, of course, to our Truth and Conviction fans, uh, also very grateful to, to have you folks tuning in. Um, this is going to be kind of a fun one. We've got some special guests uh, coming in and uh, joining me and helping me out. Uh, anybody who's watched any of our live streams before this know that um, I, I don't love doing these, uh, but I especially don't love being here all by myself all the time. <laughs> so we're going to have uh, a couple of uh, really cool guys that will join me here in studio, and I'm uh, looking forward to that. I, I wanted to talk just kind of right off the bat a little bit uh, about... Uh, this phase of this project that we're that we're in of getting the truth and conviction series made so that uh, so that everyone can see it um, we're we're in a phase which uh, the attorneys tell us we can call the testing the waters phase and if I can just explain just very briefly what that means so we are not yet open for investments um, we intend to we hope to be able to uh, open up an investment round but before we do that uh, we are just gauging interest, just trying to get the word out, see you know how interested people are in in helping us uh, tell a story about three teenagers in Nazi Germany who st stood up to Hitler, and we're willing to pay the ultimate price to do it. So at at this stage of the game, um, people can express interest in in the project, um, and and in fact, there you go. If you if you uh, if you Click, if you go to angel.com slash truth, you'll come to this site and you can see it there. Um, and there's a, a cool little video that you can watch that talks about uh, why we're making this movie. And if you scroll down, it'll, it'll tell you about uh, the team behind it and, uh, and a lot about the project. But you also see just right there, express interest. And that's where you can click on that and just say, hey, you know, if and when this opens for an investment, um, I'd be interested in investing this much, this much. And that's the beauty of this, is that it's, it's crowdfund investing, but it's not like the typical crowdfund that, uh, that most people are familiar with, where you, know, you, you donate 100 bucks and, and maybe get a t-shirt or something. Um, that's not what this is. This is a, a crowdfund investment. And so someone may look at this and, and think, man, if, this, if there was an investment open, uh, I would you know, I'd invest a hundred bucks in this. And when they do that, you know, if we're able to get to that point, um, they are a part owner in this project. And, uh, and I think that's a, that's a really cool thing. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, if you haven't already been there, go to truth, excuse me, go to uh, angel.com slash truth and, uh, and check it out. And if you want to express interest, of course, we would love that. Um, tonight, I'm going to be joined by uh, two very close friends of mine and two guys that I work with a lot and have worked with for, for many years. Um, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where, you know, in, in a work situation, 
you meet a, a coworker and you just get along really, really well, and you just think, man, you know, this I want to, I want to work with them more. And in fact, after work, I wouldn't mind hanging out with them. Um, that's the way my experience has been uh, with uh, my two uh, producing partners on this, um, Russ Kendall and, and John Foss. And, uh, and we've been down quite a long road together and we're, we're all really excited to, uh, um, to be closing in on this goal that we've had for a number of years of being able to make this series. Um, so Cameron, let's go ahead and uh, pull the uh, dramatic zoom out, if you will. Oh, there they are. Surprise. We've been here the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> sitting sitting next to me the whole time. Guys, Russ. Hey. John. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to our live stream. <laughs> Thanks for the intro, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Russ and I have been watching these many weeks Matt do this by himself, and we're like, gosh, we're glad that we don't have to do that. <laughs> That's right. Welcome to my world. Yeah. You have done an amazing job. <laughs> well, so, thank you. And happy to have you keep doing them. So. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <for> sure. <laughs> uh, we'll try and share and share alike. Um, but I did mean what I, but, and we've talked about yeah. that before, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way that you, that you dive into a project, especially mm. one that, that's as, as big and as, mm. as, you know, taken the years that it has to get where we are. Right. And you're still, in fact, you're closer friends. Uh, for having done that, so uh, ah, you know, yeah. it's a, a, this makes it all that, all that much better. Uh, you know, if I if I can just jump in on that yeah. as well, you know, we, this we've been down a long road together on this. Uh, there are also some others that that have been with us on this road at, at Kaleidoscope Pictures. Just want to give a shout out to yeah. you know Adam Andreg and Micah Merrill, uh, partners at Kaleidoscope, and uh, in fact, uh, they were. Russ, Adam, and Micah were part of the original team uh, when I came on board and, and joined this project. So it's, uh, it's been a joy to, to work together. Yeah. Should... Shout out to Adam and Micah. And if we could have fit five of us around this table, <laughs> uh, we would have had them in, in here as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John, yeah. for that. Um, guys, you kind of know what the plan is, but... Yeah. We're, we're going to talk about kind of the road that we've been on. We've worked on lots of projects together and mm -hmm. show some clips of that uh, some cool projects that we've had and uh see if people think they're as interesting as we do <laughs> well you know matt's mentioned that uh we've worked on a lot of projects together this particular one the truth and conviction series has been around for for quite a while it's been a project we're, we're very committed to and, and a story we're uh thrilled to be telling um over the years though we've you know we've traveled the world together i mean you know you and i john you and i have been in uh uh, was it Belarus? Not Belarus. Uh, Belgium, Belgium. Recently on a project. London. London. Exactly. Lithuania. Yeah. Lithuania. Been around. Russ uh, and I have strolled on China. a romantic beach on in Puerto Rico, <laughs> collecting conch shells. Do you remember that moment? I was going to go a different direction. Okay. <laughs> I was going to, you know, <laughs> more professional, maybe. Maybe, okay. you know, we, we, you know, <laughs> coast of Kenya, jungles of India, the yeah. caught in a protest on the streets of uh, Bangladesh. Right. Oh Remember that? Philippines. In the Philippines. Yeah. We got 3 a.m. in the morning stuck in a, a stairwell. <sighs> Forgot about in, the stairwell. Uh, in Budapest. Oh Managed to get out of that one. So, yeah, we've had some, uh, some fun experiences, all in the name of telling stories and sharing stories that we feel are important and uh, that we care about. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of work, a lot mm -hmm. of effort, you know. So uh, you, you want it to be worth something. Um, one of the you know projects that uh, we wanted to share that we've been involved with was a, a film called Winter Thaw, and it uh, originated um, from a Leo Tolstoy, a beloved short story, uh, often called Martin the Cobbler, and uh, it, story of this cobbler. Uh, he's nearing the end of his life, and um, it's set in late 1800s Russia, and a story that. Um, you know, of somebody that, that's really kind of lost his way, lost hope, lost uh, connection uh, with, with the things that matter most. Mm. And uh, we, we resonate with stories like that. You know, people that, that uh, have to overcome adversity and, and trials and, and find a way forward. Yeah. Um, kind of a running theme in a lot of the work we do. Um, let's just take a, a quick look uh, at some behind the scenes uh, footage. This last scene's about reconciliation, it's about new hope, 
and um, father and son reuniting and so this is Martin crossing that bridge in a way forgiving leaving the past behind he's going to go up and and um, reconcile with his son so what I was saying in that clip was talking about you know we had a scene where the cobbler was crossing a bridge and it was kind of a uh, symbolic of a bridge that he was crossing to reconcile himself with an estranged son and also with God. Um, the, this cobbler, uh, it, what we tried to do with this story was uh, really dive into the backstory of Martin the cobbler, who in the short story, uh, his journey is basically he's told in a dream that uh, the Savior will visit him on Christmas Day. And so he's trying to prepare for that. We was, took a step back from that and said, okay, what got him to the point? What is his backstory? And so uh, we learned about his, uh, his wife dying at a very young age and being estranged from his son. And basically in the process of a lot of loss and a lot of tragedy, he distanced himself from his son and from God. And so it's a story of, you know, is it too late? Uh, how do you overcome regrets? How do you realize that you can uh, move forward? And it's, it's not too late. And so uh, that uh, was the, uh, the story behind Winter Thaw. And as you can see, we had the honor and privilege to work with uh, a beloved actor, you know, John Reese Davies, who's, mm -hmm. you know, been in, you know, two of the, I'd say, you know, most popular uh, trilogies in film history, uh, playing Sala in the Indiana Jones uh, series, and obviously Gimli mm -hmm. in Lord of the Rings. And uh, yeah, I mean, to work with somebody like John, who is just, so experienced, obviously Shakespearean uh, trained actor, but just immerses himself in a role and in a character. And to have that type of experience and, and uh, to, to come and, and embody Martin the Cobbler uh, just really elevated the whole production. And, uh, brought, yeah. brought the words to life. And, yeah. when, when I met him, when I worked with him, I, or, you know, yeah. I just felt like that was the closest I'd ever get to joining a fellowship. We're a fellowship. Are we not a fellowship? <laughs> we are a fellowship. Okay, but not, not the cool one. <laughs> We're taller. Right. Okay. <laughs> we have our journey to Mordor, I guess. Should we show a clip? A sure. Minute? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. Got to show, show a clip from Winter Thaw. Stefanovic, do you believe in God? Of course. My departed wife came to me in a dream. And she said that he would visit me today. He? Our Lord. On the day of his birth. <laughs> you are blessed. Blessed? Yeah, so as you can see from this scene, you know, with John Reese davies and the incredible Carl Johnson, you know, just having actors of such maturity and experience just really brought some power and, and emotion and depth to, uh, to this movie. So. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, jumping off of that, uh, there's another one that we worked on together most recently. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, we want to keep sharing some things with you all to, uh, to kind of get an understanding of our work and, uh, the breadth of it, you know, uh, something that we recently made. It, it's, it's a short film. It's called The Christ Child. We made it just a couple of years ago. Um, but we were, we were lucky to partner with Bonneville Communications. Every year they do this holiday Christmas campaign called Light the World. And it's a, it's a great campaign. They, they put up these like vendor booths uh, around major cities in the U.S. And you can go and, and contribute money, put it in the vendor booth. Uh, but you're not buying like a candy bar. You're, you're buying like... Uh, chickens or, or boots or clothing for for those in need and, and the needy and so um, anyway it, it was just a joy to be a part of that campaign and they wanted to create a film uh, a new film about the nativity about light coming into the world so uh, Russ and I uh, collaborated on this and and tried to think of a way to revisit the nativity in a way that felt fresh and new and different you know uh, and so we came up with this idea of the Christ child, really focusing on Mary and Joseph as humans, ordinary people having an extraordinary experience. And uh, we stuck with this theme of light coming into the world. You know, we looked at other, uh, as far as like references for our work, you know, we looked at like uh, classic painters like Rembrandt and Caravaggio, you know, masters of light and contrast. And so we really took that in, 
that inspiration into our work. And, um, and we're able to film something, I think, really, really magical. Um, you know, I, we do have a clip of it. It's, it's a longer clip, but um, if, you, if you'll hang with us, I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, the clip is from the, the latter part of the, of the film. It's when um, the wise men come and visit uh, the Christ child. Now, oftentimes, you know, when we see the nativity, it's, we're so used to the big pageantry of the nativity, you know, that we see the baby Jesus laid in the manger, and then the, the three wise men show up and bow down before the baby. But historically, that's, that's not really accurate. You know, uh, the New Testament, like, lays out that, like, possibly the wise men came even as late as, like, two years to come and visit the child. Uh, and so we took that and ran with it, and we ended up... Um, finding some amazing, some amazing uh, people to play our, our wise men. That's the other thing is like we, we look at like the wise men as like three wise men because of the three gifts that they gave, but there could have been many. So we did a lot of different things to, to freshen up the story, to try to make it uh, as authentic as we could uh, to, you know, to the biblical research. And we shot it in Aramaic. So I'll just throw that out at you. Uh, there's no subtitles. It's shot in Aramaic, a dead language. But this is the, the final moments of the film, uh, The Christ Child. Oh, I love that. So I powerful, that. man. I, there were a couple scenes that we were trying to decide on, and, and uh, you know, that one, people react to that scene the most. Yeah. They, they talk about that scene a lot. If you want to watch the whole movie, you can find it <clears throat> excuse me, on YouTube. It's uh, called The Christ Child, um, but check it out. Um, but I love that as an example of, of our work because... We, um, we, take a, we take it very seriously when we're writing our projects and our films to do the research. You know, uh, that's a case in point, you know, uh, Winter Thaw was another example. But we, we take the, the correct amount of time to do our research into our characters, into the world, to, to build the believability, but also convey the truth that these stories convey. Um, there's another one that we worked on a few years ago. Yeah, and, and, but if I can first, every time I see that, that scene, uh, I just, you know, we got into film, we decided we wanted to be filmmakers a long time ago, probably for most of us, hoping that, you know, we could make movies that people would enjoy and maybe we'd have a chance to make a movie that would impact people and change yeah. hearts. And uh, that one does. And Winter Thaw does. Mm. And we've been blessed to have had a number of projects to work on together that there were more than just making movies, you know, more than just for entertainment. That's important, you know, to be able to entertain sure. uh, people. If you're not entertaining them, yeah. they're not going to watch it. But if sure. you can, without pulling out a hammer and being exactly. preachy, if you, can, if you can tell a story that actually has a lasting impact. I remember, mm. you know, when I was, how old was I? I was young. <laughs> I was a teenager, <laughs> I think, when Dead Poet Society came right. out, mm. you know. And that, you know, Carpe Diem stuck with me. That, that still, I just yeah. thought, you know, I'm going to, I want to be a different person now after seeing that film. That's a rare thing, I think. But, but like I say, we've been in a situation and in a blessed to have been able to work on projects and create projects that, that have impacted people. And I want to talk about one that um, Russ came to me about uh, four years ago and said, I, he knows that I'm a World War II buff. I just, you know, I'm so fascinated by all things World War II. He knows that my dad was a, a B-24 bomber pilot in Europe. Um, and he came and, and said, hey, Matt, I found a story. And it's a true story, and it's a World War II story. Would you consider looking at this and, and, and maybe writing the screenplay for it? And the story that he told me just absolutely mm. blew me away. I had a hard time actually believing it was a true story. At <laughs> it seems first, a little you know. crazy. But it's a true story uh, about a, another B-24 bomber pilot in Europe, a man by the name of Claire Klein, who... Uh, was shot down uh, over over Europe, uh, survived it, you know, with a, a few members of his crew who survived it, but were captured by the Germans and ended up in a prisoner of war camp. And before the war, he had he had been a, a very gifted, talented woodworker, creating things out of wood, and kind of a self-taught violinist. You know, I think he referred to him more to himself more as a fiddler. <laughs> but um, while he was in this prisoner of war camp. He decided that he was going to try and figure out a way. I think more out of a sense of just like almost psychological survival. It's like, I have to do something. I have to do something. And so he decided, I'm going to build a violin. I'm going to make a violin. 
out of whatever tools, scraps that I can find, trade for, whatever. Anyway, when I, when Russ told me that story, I remember thinking, okay, yeah, so he, he built a violin. Yeah, so I, I just saw in my mind some kind of boxy little, you know, thing that, that he called a violin. I saw photos of the, you know, when you showed me photos yeah. of the real thing, it, it was a beautiful mm -hmm. violin, and when he played it, it played beautifully. And it ended up, you know, he played it in the camp, and it ended up becoming like this instrument of peace between the American prisoners of war and the British prisoners of war and their German guards and captors. Mm -hmm. um, true story. So anyway, I, I want to show just a brief behind the scenes. When we shot, we shot this over in, in Lithuania. And um, when we were on set, um, I got the chance to kind of express about that and, and ties to my dad being a, a B-24 bomber pilot anyway. So Ryan, if you want to just cue up that, that quick little clip. Writing this script was really a rewarding experience on a couple different levels, but probably at the deepest level is because of my personal connection to it. Uh, my dad uh, was a, a B-24 bomber pilot, and uh, although he wasn't ever shot down, thankfully, um, uh, I grew up hearing his stories. And so, you know, when I had the opportunity to write this story and, um, and flesh out the, you know, the, the true historical story that happened and also add into it other fictional characters but putting them into a non-fictional setting, um, one of the characters that I, that I put in there was a co-pilot named Reed Whitaker, and they called him Wit, and that was my dad. Uh, just kind of a really cool thing now to see the young actor that's playing this character who carries my dad's name and just uh, seeing what he's doing with it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great experience. Baby face Matt there. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I look young. But that was only a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. But I guess a gray beard uh, puts puts the years on me. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned there, uh, to be able to take my dad's namesake and and create this character called Reed Whitaker and put that in the film, and I can remember being on set and actually meeting the yeah. wonderful young actor who was playing Reed Whitaker, mm. and uh, and seeing, you know, even going by his uh, his trailer and and the name on the door said Reed Whitaker. Mm -hmm. and of course, I took pictures of it, and the, kind of a touching thing for me is that during that scripting process, I don't know if you guys remember this, but during that scripting process, mm -hmm. my dad, who was 92 at the time that that I started writing mm -hmm. the script, um, and there were times. I, the opening scene that I first wrote took place in the cockpit of the, right. you know, of the right. bomber when yeah. they were being shot down. And I can remember as I was writing this scene, my dad had told so many cool stories about what it was like to be flying and dropping bombs and, and flying through flak and everything. As I was scripting that scene, I was trying to, I, I can remember, it's like, well, where would he have reached if, the, you know, if, they, if this engine over here went out? Where would he have reached in the cockpit? What would he have done? And I wanted to call my dad and just get those details from him but unfortunately he had he was to a point he was he was not very healthy anymore like I say he was 92 years old and really wasn't able to communicate and uh, so it was this kind of really kind of a poignant experience for me to um, be writing these scenes and wishing that I could get just a couple more details a couple more, more stories from my dad um, and and wasn't able to but but again it was just so so wonderful to be able to put him in the movie in a sense yeah. and uh, and and let that be an homage an homage to him um i do want to show one brief clip from from the film um in I, I did a number of interviews over the years a whole bunch of interviews actually with other veterans of world war ii and another pilot another bomber pilot who'd been shot down and captured and was in this same uh, prison camp that claire klein was in um, shared with me the experience that he had when the war was coming to an end and their captors fled and he talked about the nazi flag the the, the swastika flag you can see in an image there that, that had flown over their over their camp all those years they were there how it came slowly down and then an american flag went up and he wept as he said it i wept as i heard it and so when i was writing this script I just thought we know this happened and this is going to be one of the last scenes um, in the script and in this movie so and it was ended up being mm -hmm. such a such a powerful moment so ryan go ahead and, and cue that clip if you would
Every once in a while, uh, as a screenwriter, you, you write a scene, you know, in my case, I have a little writing room in my basement with no windows, kind of like my little cave, uh, free of distractions. And, and you write a scene and you think, man, this sure feels powerful on the page. Um, and one of the great blessings is when a film, a script that you write actually gets made and you get to see it and it ends up, <laughs> ends up being like that. So yeah, this, it was uh, such a powerful, powerful experience. So grateful, grateful that you shared it. Grateful yeah. to be able to work with you guys on, on making content like these, these films that we've just talked about. Well, talked we, all, about we all have our own personal touchstones, you know, to these projects, you know, hearing you talk about your dad. And it, for me, the, the touchstone on that movie in a personal way was my grandfather. You know, he was a uh, World War II glider pilot, you know, and he flew two missions and uh, I mean, the fact that he flew two missions is amazing because glider pilots, they'd have to fly behind enemy lines and fight their way back. And then he flew another one and still survived. Mm -hmm. But I just remember, you know, going back, you know, he wasn't a, a prisoner of war, but, but in making that film, you know, that was, you know, uh, you know, like I said, a personal touchstone for me uh, because it made me think a lot about him and, and uh, generated a lot of gratitude, you know, for him and, and everybody in the armed forces, you know. Yeah. So it was really sweet. And also, if you would, if you notice so far in our work, there's, we do a lot of like true stories and adaptations. It's not like everything we do, but, but that's something that we're really attracted to because uh, we just understand the power of true, compelling stories, you know? Something about that scene as, you know, I was watching it again, um, thinking back to when we were filming it, uh, we had about a, a five week five or six week, six week shoot, most of it in a German prison camp that we had created. And so we spent as a crew, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours a day underneath a Nazi flag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was always flying over us. And that scene we shot as the very last scene. It's last scene of the movie, but it's also last scene we filmed. Which doesn't always happen that it way. It doesn't right? happen that way. I'm getting yeah. goosebumps right now. Yeah, you are. It was so, you can see them. <laughs> yeah, I can. It was such an amazing communal experience for all of us. Um, and on this crew, it wasn't just, you know, we're American, we were in Lithuania, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we had British actors, we had um, uh, individuals from Poland, yeah. from Latvia, from Russia. I mean, we had a real combination, uh, very international uh, cast and crew. And when that Nazi flag came down, that swastika came down, and that American flag representing freedom and it was, it really was a transformative experience. Yeah, it changed the we mood. all felt it. Nobody had to act it. Yeah. It was on camera. Yeah. yeah. They felt it. I, I, yeah. I love that. And again, I love the fact that it's all, all three of our passions and, and everybody at Kaleidoscope Films and everybody here at Angel is to make stories that make a difference, to make films, to tell stories that, that amplify light, uh, that, uh, that, that bring out the best in human beings yeah. very often in really mm -hmm. really difficult circumstances yeah um and uh and those are the kind of powerful stories that, that we love to make if you're watching this and thinking okay we love these kinds of stories too uh go over to angel.com truth and and express interest and uh, and let us know that you'd be interested in seeing uh, seeing another powerful story like this and in this case with uh, truth and conviction uh set right in Nazi Germany the whole time with these teenage boys who said enough, mm -hmm. enough, we're standing up, come what may. Um, Did I just thinking back about that scene, Russ, just going yeah. back to that, it, it made me think of like, just that how amazing that set was there in Lithuania. And do you remember that production company that came and visited us because they yes, were I do. scouting, <laughs> they were scouting locations for their series. Oh, what are you, let me jump in. Yeah. yeah, no, no, go for it. Yeah, so we were partnered with a company called Baltic Film Services, and, and they are kind of a go-to company. Uh, they had another production company courting them, uh, wanted to see if they were the right production company for them. So they came to our set, and they were walking around sloshing through the mud, and 
that you can see there. Um, and they were the team from HBO that were producing uh, HBO's Chernobyl miniseries, which you know went on to you know win multiple Emmys and just an incredible production. Yeah. And they uh, filmed there in Lithuania with uh, the same company that we're partnered with. Right. And um, you know, I'll just kind of transition there. Yeah. Um, you know, as John mentioned earlier, um, you know, research and accuracy is, is very important to us. Mm. Whether it's you know. Uh, on the script front or the actors, the, the dialogue. Um, one thing is location. Um, you know, we're doing a period piece. It's set in Hamburg, Germany in, in 1941. You know, after World War II, you know, Hamburg, most of Germany was, was leveled. And so, uh, you know, filming in Germany really wasn't, you know, probably in the cards. We did go scout Germany. Uh, we figured we'll be shooting in probably Western Europe. Uh, we went to Budapest, we went to Bucharest, Romania, uh, to Prague, um, Poland, yeah, that's right, you know, Poland. scouting yeah. all over to try and find, you know, not only the right locations, you want it to look authentic, um, but they also have to be, you know, workable, uh, affordable. You have to find a production partner that also, um, you know, logistically can mount the type of production that we're doing mm -hmm. and, you know, made a lot of wonderful contacts there. Uh, in the end, uh, we ended up, uh, choosing Lithuania again for this picture, but it wasn't until we went there for Winter Thaw and Instrument of War uh, that we decided, oh, we can shoot Truth and Treason mm -hmm. here, or Truth and Conviction. And it was, uh, you know, one afternoon, I was strolling through uh, Old Town Vilnius, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, this could double as Hamburg. And yeah. I, I, like, I either called you or texted you. you me, text. I sent a text. Send I said, a dude, text. you got to get over here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Matt, he did. Uh, S he sent me a text with a photo uh, just of a street in, yeah. in Vilnius and, and said, yeah, you got to get over here. And yeah. I, a week later, I think, I was, I was in Vilnius going, yes, <laughs> yeah. this, this will work. Yeah, so really, incredible really locations cool. there, great production partner, mm -hmm. great uh, artisans there, you know, in every department, really. Right. Um, you know, most of the crews that we've worked with there are, like I said earlier, they're kind of an international crew. Um, we didn't have to bring many folks no. over, you know, mm -hmm. from the States. And so, uh, and they know this time period and the, the costumes. They're not having to make the costumes right. from this era. They amazing. still exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The props, the cars, you know, Everything. it's there. Everything's you know, there. so we're so excited to take uh, this Truth and Conviction series back to Lithuania where we have just a solid production partner and team. And, uh, and they're excited about the story as well, which, which matters, you know. Yeah. It's not just another gig for them. Um, they, uh, we've had a great working experience with them and they resonate with the story. Um, you know, being, you know, Lithuania is a former uh, Russian uh, territory and they were the first to actually break from the former Soviet Union, declare their independence and freedom. So we're going to a place where freedom matters and they cherish it. And yeah, so that's a and in fact, there's a location in Vilnius. It's now a museum, but it was the KGB headquarters for that city. And down in the basement, there are cells, and you know that people were tortured there. The interesting thing is that it was it was KGB, and then when Germany was winning the war for a little while, it became a Gestapo headquarters, and the Gestapo was taking people in and and torturing them, um, and interrogating them there and this, and then. Russians took it over again, and the Soviets, you know, were, were the KGB was in charge of it for many, many years after that. It's still there. It's still, in some ways, especially that basement right. location in its original. It's haunting. It's haunting, and we're going to be shooting in that location. That's that, that's just so powerful. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, so that is. Uh, I hope you can sense. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how much this means to us and how excited we are, not only to be able to tell the story, but to be able to tell it and you know, shoot it in the right place and with, with the right people, the right cast, all those things, right. to be able to, to, uh, to do it right. Yeah. And if you want to learn more, please go to angel.com slash truth and you can learn more about the project and our approach to it. And, you know, let us know, you know, that you want to see this made. And uh, appreciate it. That's right. Um, we show them some clips from yeah. the little video we made. You want to set that up? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for those of you who have not seen it, if you visit, if you go to that website, you'll see a video right at the top. It's, it's a video that we call, you know, the lawyers say we have to call it testing the waters, right? We, we've mentioned this. It's, 
it's basically we're re we're generating interest. You know, we're we're building word about this series. Um, this video is is about ten minutes long, but we're gonna just watch a couple of scenes from yeah. it right now. Um, that just tells you a little bit more about the project and um, what we're doing with it. All right, Ryan, you want to cue up that first clip? Matt, take two, can they see? Mark. How did you first discover this story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group named Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, and sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was uh, as a 17-year-old with his best friend, Helmut Hubner, and another friend, Rudy, 15, 16, 17 years old, standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared. I was actually scared because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know. The truth was deadly in, in Germany. But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Carl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just the story, but people lived this. What came out of that was, you know, this not only we have to tell this story, but I feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think this kid was 16. Wasn't 25, wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. I had enough to, to realize that he wasn't gonna get he wasn't gonna give in to something that he saw was wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's you talked about in the arrest how close we became with, with Karl Heinz Schneebe. If you can think about that, uh, we became close friends with a, resist a Nazi resistance fighter who was 17 when he was doing it, 18 when he was captured and, and sentenced to years of hard labor. And, and seriously, to, to be able to go mm -hmm. back to Germany with him and, and the fact that, to me, it's still amazing that, that some of those cells that he was held in were still still there well, those buildings were still there there were still bars in right. the windows and to have him walk in i remember one time very clearly that we were walked in and we were actually filming him a little bit i think you saw some of the footage there and and at a certain point i think i kind of wanted to ask him a few questions in there and and carl said i'm out mm. and he just mm. had to had to get out you know mm. 65 years later um he had to get out and uh, which obviously i can totally you know totally understand but um that and and to have Gerald Mullen, you know, the producer of Schindler's List, wins an Academy Award for Schindler's List and worked so closely with Steven Spielberg over the years, um, to have him find out about this project and be so excited about it. And um, you guys have heard this before, but I'm going to read for them. We got a letter from Jerry. We sent him the script. And he read the script. And I can remember kind of having my fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. I hope he likes it. Yeah. You know, but... Um, I'll just read a, a short paragraph that, that uh, Gerald R. Molan uh, sent back to us after having read the Truth and Conviction script. He said, I've had the opportunity to read some phenomenal scripts in my 50 plus years in the business. And now again, I have been blessed to have read a masterpiece. Reading this story has moved me to a sense of pride, country, honor, duty, and tears. Uh, <clears throat> there was a We've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into the script, into this project. So every once in a while, you get something <laughs> that says, "I think we're on the right track. Yeah. Uh, I think we're, I think we're doing doing okay." 
Um, if you want to go to angel.com slash truth and express interest, we would sure appreciate it. This is a powerful story that, that needs to be told. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I don't like feeling like a pitch man. If you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, and I probably shouldn't have said that right after I start kind of tearing up. I, I'm not trying Good to be timing, manipulative. Matt. Please, uh, please understand that. But, uh, but there is a, a certain sense of, boy, we really, we really need your help and, uh, and appreciate any kind of interest that, that you can express in it. You know, just, just jumping off of that, you know, and, and there, there are probably a lot of people watching this who are familiar with the model, and there are probably many that are not. You know, we're filmmakers that have made films independently, self-finance. We raised equity for projects. We've been hired by networks uh, and streamers to make content. You know, so we've kind of experienced the whole gamut. This is, this is, a, this is different, you know, for us and in a very good way. You know, um, partnering with Angel to distribute the film, we're working with them to make it. Um, we're also leaning into that traditional private equity, but we're also doing some crowdfunding. So it's a hybrid approach. You know, there, there's a lot of these things, a lot of these traditional efforts, um, uh, I guess, ways of making content that we're bringing to the table. But this is this is new. So, you know, sitting at the table here and and talking about the project in this way, it's not just you know, we hope that you'll, you'll donate money. It's not that it's, it's actually an invitation for people to become involved and, and tell the story together. You know, uh, I just think about, uh, every month, the, um, the subscription services I pay, you know, for all my, all my services and I get great content because of it. But, you know, if I could donate or, or give money to something like this in advance, then I know that I've got it forever and, and I won't ever lose it and I can share it. And, uh, I think that's exciting and that's an exciting model that angel is building so it's cool it really is it's groundbreaking and they're they've cracked a nut that uh and figured out a way for independent films and independent series mm -hmm. to to crowdfund investors mm -hmm. I mean, we know for years people have been other filmmakers indie filmmakers have been trying to do that and it's right. just been almost impossible uh, to do to raise more than 50 or sixty thousand right. dollars if you've got to raise a few million or more right it's been almost impossible so why we're so grateful to be with Angel Studios. Um, I want to think, yeah. if I can just add yeah. to there, um, but appreciate with Angel is the trust that they give the creators. Right. You totally. know, the creative uh, autonomy uh, to go out and do our best work mm -hmm. and to tell the stories that, that matter. And, and you, know, you don't get that sometimes when you're, you know, working for you know, a different network or a client. Yeah. Uh, so that trust is greatly appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, I think it stems back to they... They practice what they preach. They trust the crowd. They trust uh, the uh, the power of of you know hundreds of thousands of voices mm -hmm. that say. So when we when we went to them, we submitted um, you know some kind of promotional footage proof or concept, concept. Yeah, proof mm -hmm. of concept footage that we had shot. You know several scenes from the script. They sent that to I don't know about fifty thousand of uh, of their, what they call their jury um, and. That crowd said yes, we support this. In fact, it was it ended up being one of their most popular. Yeah. I guess their their most yeah. popular or highest rated um, project that, that was sent before them. And so, and then Angel says, okay, we know this is good. We trust the crowd and we trust you. We love what you've done. We're going to help you make this movie. So, right. So uh, again, if you want to go to that, it's angel.com <laughs> forward slash truth. You can find out more. And if you want. Right now, it's you can just express your interest and uh, just click the button and, and let us know. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, let's show just another quick clip from our testing the waters video. Um, uh, I think I talk about this in the video, so I don't need to set it up too much. But just just to to be in Germany with Karl Heinz Schnuber, the last surviving member of the group, we had one day um, an experience that I will never forget. And so we talk about this a little bit in this, in this next clip. So Ryan, if you could cue that up, it'd be great. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalman Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalman disappeared and the Gestapo arrested him and Helmut never saw his friend again. I 
Wohnung wohnt hier. Wir verhaften schon seit Wochen. Ein Mann geht jetzt. Nein! Ein Mann geht jetzt. 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 Ein Mann geht jetzt.
you know, this was serious and they knew that, but they were teenagers, man. They were having, f they were having fun. And it was in a certain sense, it was an adventure until it wasn't right. You know? Um, so anyway, I just, uh, just love that. Should we look at another clip? Yeah. 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 This one Two is more. just another look. It begins with another look into uh, Baltic film, our production partner in Lithuania. So take it away. Action. We are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Conviction. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today. It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know? He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears, and he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally, I'm asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Man. That's that's amazing. I like you know talk about personal touchstones you know to our projects. Like I know this we all share the same kind of a stone for this one, and we've mentioned it before. But you know uh, it's in your screenplay, but it's kind of like something that Helmut told Carl when after they were arrested and they were in prison, uh, uh, they had a brief passing in the, in the hallway, and Helmut, uh, you know, in your script says, uh, "Never forget what we've done." You know, and we've and, and that kind of challenge to remember was given to Carl and Carl went on to share that story and, and Carl has since passed, but he's, he entrusted us with his story and with Helmut's story. And in a very real way, we've taken on Helmut's challenge to never forget, never forget. And, and I love that. And in a very real way, you know, you can do the same thing to help us uh, not remember or not forget that, but uh, help people remember it and share it with, with people who, who need to hear it or who will want to watch it. So uh, just another call out, go to angel.com forward slash truth and uh, express your interest, you know, uh, let us know if you uh, would like to see this, you know, uh, and, and spread the word, you know, share it with your friends and uh, those people that you think would find this uh, not only entertaining, but important to watch. Thanks, John. I've, I've, I've wondered, I know that I'm in, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties now, man, which is a trip, but. <laughs> Inside, I feel like I'm 17, and my wife would tell you I still act like I'm about 14 or 13, but I still feel 17. And so when I think of this 17-year-old kid who, um, who paid the ultimate price just to stand up for what he knew was right, um, it just, uh, it's so moving to me. And, and to think that when, you know, in his last words to his best friends really were, please don't forget me. Don't forget what we've done. Remember me, you know. 
Um, and so, John, I appreciate you expressing that because that is that is the way we feel about this, and uh, and and frankly grateful to to have been entrusted to to tell this story. Yeah. Um, do we have time? Can you tell us? Do we have time for questions? Uh, to field any questions, will Ryan answer us? Okay, we've got a couple questions. Perfect. Um, so bring them up, and we'll let's see. What impact do you hope this series has on the rising generations? Kai, thank you. That's a good. That's a good question. Anybody want to take a stab? Uh, you know, I we've I think we've we spoke about it in a, in our first live stream too. Uh, yeah, I remember us kind of expressing how, at least for me, you know, in my family, I look at my children. You know, I have four children and and teenagers and. Uh, I hope that that this story will resonate with them, you know, because what Helmut was doing, he was standing up for truth. He was doing what he felt was right. And uh, these days, you know, with social media, with man, the, the kind of trouble and, and the, the world that the kids just put into it with social media and just how that can affect them emotionally and mentally, it can really discourage them. Um, so I think that that there needs to be positive stories out there for 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 teenagers and for everybody, really. But to just engender bravery and courage and uh, standing up for what's right. Yeah, yeah. I love, you know, this is a story that happened so many years ago, but uh, the fact that it's about teenagers is what one of the things that we love about it. The fact that, yes, it will, you know, people from our generation are, are probably going to like it. People from our parents' generation are going to love it. Um, but the teenagers, the kids love it as well because they're seeing their peers standing up for what is right. Now, you know, thankfully, our kids don't have to stand up for what they did, you know, in Nazi Germany, but they do have to stand up against bullies, and they do mm -hmm. have to stand up against, when they see something that's wrong that's happening, they do have to stand up for what's right, you know? And so I, I, that's what I hope. So anyway, Kai, to answer your question, I don't know, Russ, if you had any thoughts on that's that, great. but you got another question there, Ryan? Is it, challenge, is it challenging writing for historical characters? I'll take that one. Uh, <laughs> the writer. Yeah, uh, having, having been a co-writer, and I should also give a shout out to, to Ethan Vincent, who is, has been uh, my co-writer and co-screenwriter on this project for many, many years. Um, just an incredible partner. He lives in Vienna, and, uh, and we write long distance. Uh, but uh, yeah, writing for historical characters, um, I love it, but it is, it is a challenge. You do as much research as you can, but at a certain point, you kind of have to extrapolate out and think, well, what if? What's you know, what could this have, what what could this person have been like in this instance? You know, because historically we don't know. I mean, a case in point, and a very powerful part of the way we're telling this story is the Gestapo agent, who was relentlessly hunting down whoever was putting out these flyers. He was just convinced. We know he was convinced that it was probably a university professor because Helmut even though he was only 16, was a genius, <laughs> I think, and, and was writing things that the Gestapo were looking at and saying, this has to be like a university professor or something. Um, and there's some that we know about this man, but there's a lot that we don't. And so we flesh it out and we do a lot of research about, well, what was a typical Gestapo age, agent like? And, and uh, you know, what would what would they have done in this situation? And so that is one of the, the challenges, but also a process that, that I love. You know, the difference of going, uh, the difference between making a documentary film and making a narrative film or telling a true story, you know, in a, in a, in a narrative format. Yeah. Um, get it's, the chance to do that. It's, it's a process. I mean, for sure. I, I think back when we were developing, you know, Instrument of War, you know, we would sit, uh, we would have these development meetings and we would sit around our conference room table. Do you remember this? And we would after read the script, we would read the script and we'd come back to the table and as you do, you know, and we would just give notes, you know, and we would talk about the character, Claire Klein. And really I think the most challenging thing when you're writing for a historical character is like trying to find out what, what motivates them and, um, and, and have it be something that, that people will care about, you know, because we're making something that's ultimately entertainment, right? Um, but we have to do it in an, in, in an entertaining way. Uh, you know, and I just, I just remember that very vividly, you know, on many projects, but just that one as an example, just that, you know, the time and the process that it takes to really just mine 
these historical figures and bring them to life. One of the blessings we had with Truth and Conviction is Carl. Yeah. You know, to become point. such great friends with Carl and have a first person eyewitness yes, experienced it. Mm. You know, to have him describe to us what it was like to be tortured by the Gestapo, to be taken from his home, to be locked up, to stand yeah. trial before the Blood Tribunal, which is the highest quartered court in Hitler's uh, Nazi party. Yeah. Yeah. And to have, you know, somebody just tell us that with such conviction and... He was yeah. there. He was yeah. there. I'm so glad you brought that up because there were, how many times yeah. did we do that? Hey, Carl, we're writing the, the courtroom <laughs> scene. <laughs> Uh, can you tell us, like, so how, where did yeah. you stand and how did this happen this way and everything? And to just get, like you yeah. say, those firsthand yeah. details of, of what it was like to stand in Hitler's court. As know? a teenager. As a teenager. As a teenager. I mean, that's so it's Great amazing. question. Amazing. Yeah, and obviously something that we're passionate about. But, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, we've got another, another question there. Did Carl ever regret what they did and that it got mm. his friend killed? Um, I, I can say without question that he did not regret what they did. In fact, he, he told us that on a, on a number of occasions. Um, I do not regret what we did. Um, even though he had to pay, you know, Helmut paid the ultimate price, but Carl and Rudy were in hard labor for years. And, and Carl actually, right before the end of the war, was forced into the German army mm -hmm and then was captured by the, the Soviets, captured by the Russians, and spent four more years uh, as a prisoner in Siberia. So Carl really had stories and really had, you know, yeah. experienced what, what this was, but he still said to his dying day that he would never regret what, right. what they did. Yeah, there, there's, there's nuance to that too, because Carl was the oldest of the three. And uh, when they went to that blood tribunal, you know, he could have, his, his sentence could have been way more severe, but Helmut stood up and, and took it upon himself as the one that was truly responsible. So That's right. They were, the Nazis decided, which is weird for us to say, no, the Nazis decided we're going to go after the adult. Carl had turned 18 by then. Mm -hmm. And Helmut saw that happening. Carl feels that Helmut saw that happening. And, so, and then just like, like you said, just took all the blame, yeah. got in the face of the judge, pointed out where he was lying and, and those kinds of things. And so... Carl always felt that, that Helmut saved his life. Yeah. So, so yeah, I just love seeing those pictures of Carl, mm -hmm. his smile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's like you never know what road somebody's gone down. You know, you see this, this, you know, older gentleman with this great smile. Thank you for putting that up again. And then you hear what he, what he's endured, yeah. you know, and how he f has found the way to forgive those that tortured him, to find a way to carry on you know, the, the memory and the, the charge that Helmut gave him. Don't forget what we did. And, uh, you know, he's, he's done that. He did that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, unless there, uh, I think, oh, we do have another question here. Okay. See, do you feel there has or will be any opposition to this worthwhile project? We've been at it for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Time so, opposition. <laughs> opposition, opposition, not to telling this kind of story. I don't think no. I mean, op the opposition really has been how hard it is to raise the money that it takes to mm -hmm. tell a story like this in the way that it needs to be told, and yeah. that's and that's been the opposition. And so, segue to you have the opportunity to help us overcome that. And so, if you can just go to angel.com/truth and um, express your interest. Just let us know if you think, you know what, this is something that I'd like to be involved with if, uh, if they ever do start asking for investments. That was a great question, Diane. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, any, other, any other questions? or One more question. Okay. This says it's a series. How many seasons are you hoping to make? Uh, another really good question. Um, right now, our current plan is that we're going to make a four episode limited series about the Helmut Hubner story. Mm -hmm. um, if it's as successful as we all hope that, that it will be and intend for it to be, uh, there are definitely plans to follow that up with a, with a second season, another story, really creating what we referred to as a truth and conviction universe. Kind of similar to the way Marvel... An anthology. Yeah, an, know, an anthology. So another story that, that may 
you know, may not be about Helmut and the boys, but it's another story that is an example of somebody standing up for truth or having the conviction to do what they know is right. And so, and of course, what I really see this as becoming, and we've talked about this, is, you know, you hear people say, man, I just heard this true story. Somebody should make a movie about that. I think that that's what the Truth and Conviction series really should become mm. and could become. Uh, is we're the guys that make those movies that everybody says, hey, somebody should make a movie about yeah. it. I never knew that story. Glad yeah. I do now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Exactly. So again, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, you for that, for that, that question, Darren. All right. Well, I think um, that's all the questions that we have time for. Uh, thank you. to, to Thanks, you guys, yeah, for thanks joining for having me us, in, this, in this process. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and thank you to all of you who, who tuned in. Um, I, I know that uh, there have been those of you who have been pledging interest even during this, uh, even during this live stream, and we're and we're grateful. Oh, Ryan, can you bring up uh, just kind of where we're at on the on the final? So, wow, yeah. So, uh, this past week we crossed over a uh, million dollars in interest expressed, and even just during this this live stream, there have been a number of you who have who have raised that number, and that's. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you to all of you who expressed interest in the Truth and Conviction Project. Um, and if I can just give a quick plug for a future live stream. Um, I think on the 30th, uh, 30th of this month, there's going to be an Angel Studios uh, live stream where they're going to feature some of the, some of the new teams, the new creators that are, that are developing projects. And, there's some and, good ones. Yeah, there's some really good ones. And we're, we're fortunate enough to be a part of that on, um, on August 30th. And then... Uh, what we're pl the plan is is that on September 7th, Wednesday, September 7th, we'll do another live stream, and we're going to feature a man who I believe is the last living person who knew Helmut and, and remembers him, a um, man by the name of Werner Zomerfeld, and uh, just recently went up and spent some time with Werner, and he agreed to let us film it. And so we're going to talk to Werner and, and get his perspective as a 92-year-old man who knew Helmut. And so put that on your calendars, and, uh, and I hope you have the chance to, to tune in to that. Uh, other than that, unless you guys got anything else you want to say? No, this has been great. Okay. Look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, and we will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>